Coming up on Philosophy Talk. Fear and trembling. Faith versus reason. The sickness unto death. The philosophy of Soren Kierkegaard. Nothingness, non-existence, black emptiness. What did you say? Oh, I, I was just planning my future. Can we only face the world with resignation and despair? Oh, if only God would give me some sign. If he would just speak to me once. Anything, one sentence, two words. If he would just cough. How can we achieve direct union with the divine? Is faith a mystery? Is faith a paradox? Just just one miracle. If, if I could see a burning bush or, or the seas pot or, or my Uncle Sasha pick up a check. The philosophy of Kierkegaard. Coming up on Philosophy Talk after the news. Welcome to Philosophy Talk, the program that questions everything. Except your intelligence. I'm John Perry. And I'm Ken Taylor. We're coming to you from the studios of KALW San Francisco. Continuing conversations that began at Philosopher's Corner on the Stanford campus. Today, the philosophy of Soren Kierkegaard. Ken Kierkegaard is really high on my list of philosophers. Which list of philosophers? The list of philosophers that I haven't read much of, don't understand at all, and doubt that I ever will. <laughs> John, that's a that's quite an admission, John. It's, it betrays a large gap in your philosophical education, I'm afraid. Kierkegaard was a very important uh, Danish philosopher of the of the early and mid 19th century. I mean, he criticized Hegel severely. I would have thought that would that would warm your heart. So, what's the problem? Just never got around to. Uh, giving Kierkegaard a try? No, Ken, I've tried a number of times. Uh, admittedly, he didn't like Hegel, that's good. But apart from that, he just seems to exemplify everything I dislike in a philosopher. I like philosophers who tell you what they think in clear and a straightforward manner. Kierkegaard wrote under a bunch of pseudonyms. I guess he wrote poetically, but to me it just comes across as turgid. I think reason is the method of philosophy. Kierkegaard thinks we should accept contradictions and make leaps of faith. Ugh. Oh, John. Well, you know, Kierkegaard was poetic, and he was, is sometimes turgid. I have to admit that. But I, I think you've got, I don't think you've got him quite right. I mean, Kierkegaard thinks we have to accept paradoxes, but I wouldn't say he thinks we have to accept contradictions. A and the difference is? Well, Christianity is full of what... Kierkegaard calls paradoxes, like that Jesus is both human and divine. That is a paradox. It's a paradox because we, with our reason, can't hope to figure out how it could be so. But it's not a contradiction because Jesus is both human and divine in, in the Christian universe. And to say Jesus is both divine and not divine, now that would be a contradiction. Kierkegaard doesn't say we should accept logical contradictions like that, but he does think we very much do need to accept things that we can't hope to understand with human reason. Okay, so a leap of faith isn't accepting a contradiction, it's just accepting something you can't hope to understand and acting on it. Why should anyone make a leap of faith? Why should we accept something we don't understand and act on it, especially if our actions lead to crazy behavior that affects others, like Abraham getting ready to kill his son Isaac because God told him to? Kierkegaard thought that was really cool, right? Yeah, he thought Abraham was actually in that action the great exemplar of faith. Now, he admits that Abraham's kind of paradoxical, and I suppose Abraham himself has a paradox because Abraham knew it was morally wrong to kill Isaac, but God was commanding him to kill Isaac, so Abraham thought it was his religious duty to kill Isaac, and he would have killed Isaac if the angel hadn't intervened with a reprieve from God Abraham was completely, completely ready to obey God, to take a leap of faith, even though he didn't understand how to fit it all together, the demands of the ethical and the demands of God into a coherent picture, and he also was prepared to kill Isaac with the utter confidence that God would find a way to make this all all right. So tell me, I mean, why was Abraham better than Agamemnon? who sacrificed his own daughter to bring success at Troy. Because uh, Agamemnon was not uh, doing this thing that goes beyond reason, goes beyond the ethigo. Agamemnon was doing what the morality of his time dictated. He was killing a loved one, that's to be sure, that's a bad thing, but in order to bring success in battle and save his city-state, I mean, that's sometimes you have to sacrifice something that you cherish by doing something higher. Now, for Kierkegaard, 
complying with traditional morality. It, 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 killing Abraham wasn't complying with traditional morality. That goes beyond that. And and traditional morality isn't the best kind of life. One should obey one's own inner subjectivity, one's own inwardly felt religious duty, especially when you, one recognizes it as from God. That's what Abraham was doing. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Kierkegaard and you seem to feel strongly about this, Ken, but it seems to me Abraham was obviously nuts, a psychotic who almost committed murder. Why would any philosopher approve of such a thing? Well, you know, I have to admit that in my own moments, I, I have my suspicions about Abraham's sanity. But, the, I mean, don't you think Kierkegaard has at least a kind of a point? Isn't the person who marches to the beat of a different drummer, an internal drummer, someone to be admired often? I mean, the person who has the courage of her convictions. Think of John Brown, the anti-slavery zealot. He was probably a bit unbalanced, but I admire his passionate desire to end slavery, however ill-considered some of his actions might have been. Well, all right. You've got a point there. I kind of admire John Brown, too. Uh, but look, inwardly, Abraham doesn't understand what he's being asked to do. He can't make sense of it, and yet he's going to act on it. Now, maybe John Brown uh, accepted a lot of Christian paradoxes. I don't know. But when it came to the attack on Harper's Ferry, he understood why he was doing it. I suspect he had a very clear and consistent internal story about why slavery was wrong and how raiding Harper's Ferry might help to alleviate that. But people who take radical actions like murder on the basis of beliefs they don't really understand and can't make sense of, I still don't see what's admirable about that. Well, John, I think we need a little help in making you appreciate Kierkegaard's subtlety. Well, you're right. And I, and I hope some of our listeners can help. Uh, take the leap of telephonic faith. The number is 1-800-525-9917. That's 1-800-525-9917. And we've asked our colleague Lanier Anderson to join us. Lanier is a professor of philosophy at Stanford and has particular expertise in 19th century philosophical thinking. But before we talk to Lanier, our roving philosophical reporter, April Dembowski, has been talking to people about everyday leaps of faith. She files this report. There's a Hollywood version of falling in love. I've loved you ever since the first second I saw you. Man waits all his life for a woman like that. I love you for the rest of my life. And then there's real life. There always seems to be something that's wrong with the person. Alicia is 36 and lives in San Francisco. She's been dating since she was 15. Every person that's sort of like, ah, oh, this drives me nuts, or I don't feel at ease as, as I should. I think there's a lot of shoulds in dating. And a lot of criteria. Alicia has a list. Intelligent, like quite intelligent. A little ironic and a little critical. Someone who likes being outside. Someone who really wants to continue their search of developing themselves. She finally met a guy who measured up against her checklist. There was just one thing at first. He was very into me in the beginning and I was a little worried. Um, because he was so into me, and I didn't feel like he knew me, and so I was a little ambivalent. And then I think he got to know me better and then became ambivalent himself. And really when I say ambivalence, I mean fear. Now Alicia feels caught in a web of her own doubts and rationalizations. I'm to the point where it feels like I need to take a leap of faith. It's going to work out, and I need to put my ambivalence and all the thoughts in my head that are screaming, is this right? I don't know if this is right. Jump ship. And then part of me is saying, no, stay, stay, stay. This is a tension that Oakland therapist Dan Weil often sees. He's been counseling couples for 30 years. There's a kind of person who falls in love easily. And there's a kind of person who doesn't do that. Who, while really liking the partner, um, has worries and hesitancies. Is this the right one? Is there someone better? Weil helps couples have constructive conversations about commitment, but sometimes talking it through just isn't enough. For the type of person who does not immediately say, yes, this is it, uh, the decision to, to get married is always a leap of faith. Um, that person is, has to work through, well, nothing's perfect, but I've looked around enough, so I'll go for it. But going on faith doesn't end at the altar. Couples have to take leaps of faith over and over again. Maybe one partner wants a baby and the other doesn't. Or political views suddenly become an issue. Or maybe there's an affair. The idea is to solve the moment rather than solve the problem. 
Weil tries to get couples to focus on feelings rather than fighting. We would try to get them kind of sad together about how one is being disappointed and the other one is feeling pressured and what a difficult position that is, and hoping that by having those kind of conversations, they'll be able to work something out. A therapist can't engineer a leap of faith, but they seem to come easier when couples work with each other, not against each other. They can find themselves saying these vulnerable things that if they were thinking about it, they might say, I'm not going to say this. He could use it against me later on. When you're in the collaborative mode, in the loving mode, you can forget a lot of these dangers and do the leap of faith kind of automatically without any effort or or thinking at all. Falling in love may require a leap of faith, but then again, so might staying in love. For Philosophy Talk, I'm April Domboski.